Hello, YouTube. My name is Alan, and it's that time once again. Let's talk metal. For this particular episode, I'm going to do one of the things that I do best. Pull some obscure singles off of the shelf and play a few clips, tell you a little bit about these bands that kind of, you know, slid through the cracks, never were able to quite grab that brass ring. And this way, they get their 15 minutes of fame and fortune. The singles I've picked tonight are from the new wave of British heavy metal. I'll bet you didn't see that one coming. Uh, but yeah, cool bands, nevertheless, even though they're not really big names from that particular scene. Some of these are a little bit rare and collectible. Some of these are really not that expensive, though. So if you hear something you like, won't necessarily be that hard to track down a copy of your very own. Let's get started with band number one. This is a UK group named Cynic. Uh, yeah, it's the same name as the famous Florida sort of, you know, tech death metal band, but obviously not the same unit whatsoever. This is a small time British act who released this one single in 1983. It pairs the songs Suicide with the flip side, No Time at All. And let's go ahead and go straight to a clip from the song Suicide. As usual with these videos, I may jump ahead a little bit in the clip just so that you can kind of hear the main part of the song, since some of these songs have, you know, kind of intros that take a little while to get going. But enough about that. Let's get started with a clip from Cynic with Suicide. So there is a bit of Cynic's Suicide. Kind of a slow, moody number, and it very slowly builds throughout the course of the song. It gets even a little bit faster and more forceful later in that particular track. So it's a really nicely built and constructed song. Uh, sounds quite good. It's got a heaviness to it. Uh, definitely a little bit, you know, more of kind of a doomy element. You wouldn't call it doom metal, of course. You know, just that it sounds, yeah, you know, a little bit more menacing, uh, little more creepy maybe than typical for new wave of British heavy metal. The flip side is also good. Now I have not pulled up a clip of that one, so we'll just hear the one side from Cynic this evening. But yeah, uh, quite a good single. We got a really strong write-up in the new wave of British heavy metal encyclopedia. I do think the author went a little overboard on this single. He started comparing it to things like, uh, you know, Masters of Puppets era Metallica. This is like, Okay, hold on. Let's <clears throat> let's not overshoot here. Uh, don't need to overhype it quite that much. No, I, I don't think this was going to make an appearance on a you know Master of Puppets outtakes reel or anything like that. But nevertheless, it's still a very good song and a bit heavier than maybe your typical new wave of British heavy metal band. Back when that book was written, uh, this single was relatively hard to find and was fairly expensive you know and by fairly expensive i mean it pushed the three figure mark since that time some quantity of these did turn up some of the band members did stay active and they actually put out some more material later on and eventually uh, a dealer did get multiple copies of this so nowadays it's really not that hard an item to track down you'll see it on ebay probably at least once or twice a year and the price tends to swing a bit. So if you're patient, you could probably get a copy of this like in the you know, 30 to $40 range. If you absolutely must have it the very next time you see it, you might have to pay a little north of $50 for it. But it's definitely cheaper than it used to be since more copies have come out of the woodwork. Now, I mentioned the band did release a few other things. They had demoed some tracks in 1982. Uh, I've heard that demo. It's been a long time since I played it. I 
you know, it's not very fresh in my memory, but I remember the demo tracks also being pretty good. They also demoed some material in 1987, which I have not heard, so I cannot comment on that. There was a compilation of material released back in 2003, but the band did release a full-length album in 2008. Uh, another sort of, you know, let's get the band back together. There were several of these, you know, new wave of British heavy metal projects that were doing the reunion thing even then. I know a lot of us tend to think of these reunions as being a big happening just in the past, you know, maybe five to 10 years, but there was a wave of them happening even in the early 2000s. The album that Cynic released in 2008 is entitled Suburban Crisis. Kind of a weird title. You know, right away, it almost makes you think more of like a hardcore act or something. The cover art is also very strange. I don't have a copy of it. If you want to see it, you can look it up over on Metal Archives. But it's got this image of like kids on some kind of oversized swing set, but they're swinging over what basically looks like a landfill. The whole area is just, you know, strewn with garbage. Um, and it's done in kind of a weird style. I'm not sure if it's a weird Photoshop job or they've kind of taken a photograph and altered it a little bit or something. It's a very odd cover and a very odd title. I heard it when it came out, and to be honest, I wasn't very impressed with the material. That said, it's been 15 or so years ago since I heard it, and I haven't ever gone back and checked it out again. So, I, you know, it's the kind of thing I should probably revisit, at least kind of refresh my brain on what it sounds like. Uh, so I'm not going to say much about it. If you're interested, it can be found online. But that's been it for Cynic to date. So yeah, one cool single, some cool demo tracks. Not that hard to track down the material if you're interested. All right, that's going to lead us into act number two for the evening. Uh, this is a band called Duchess. Now, before we even get to any clips or something, we've got to clear up here. Duchess made this one single in 1981. Uh, those of you who are strong with the grammar will notice right away that the band name is misspelt here. There should not be a T in the middle of Duchess. Kind of an honest mistake, because if you think of the word Dutch, it has a T in it, and then if you're thinking Duchess, well, you stick an ESS on the end of it, and there you go. Except that's not how it works. Duchess doesn't have a letter T in the middle. The few things I've ever found to read about this have always made a big deal out of this misspelling. So like, oh yeah, the band misspelled it. The band misspelled it. I myself would like to think that the band members were savvy enough to understand, even in 1981, that heavy metal bands were supposed to intentionally misspell their name, and they put the T in the middle of it on purpose. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That's my little conspiracy theory for the evening, and I'm going to stick to it. Even though it is very likely they just didn't... Uh, Double check how to spell it before they slapped it on the record. You know, this is a pretty small time affair. They only did the one single, and it's a pretty good one. It pairs the tracks. Let's see. The A side is Your Love, and the B side is Dead and Gone. So let's start off with a clip from the A side. This is Duchess with Your Love. <laughs>
right, there is the A side. Like that track quite a bit. It's got enough of a rumble to it that you know it's competent, but sounds just rough enough around the edges that you know this is you know kind of a small time act. Yeah, I like the guitar tone, kind of you know uh, very squealy, but a cool solo bit. It does mellow out dangerously in the core in the uh, verses there, but it's got a really good catchy chorus. It gets a little heavier again. Nice catchy hook to it. So yeah, I've always thought it was a pretty cool song. Flip side is similar, but a little more uh, solid, straightforward track. Let's check out a clip from the flip side, Dead and Gone. Again, this is by Duchess. <laughs> And so there's a bit of Dead and Gone. Again, a little more forceful, straightforward track there. It's another very good one. This is one of those singles where both sides get the thumbs up. We don't have the one side killer and one side eh, filler phenomenon. I like both the Duchess tracks quite a bit. The A side obviously leans a little more, you know, I guess, you know, mainstream appeal, but it's still a heavy enough track for my money. Uh, the Duchess single's always been a little bit hard to come by. Um, never came with a picture sleeve. They never released anything else, to my knowledge. So it, that is it. You have two tracks and not a whole lot of other information. At least one of the members did stay involved and played with some other acts throughout the 1980s. I think they tried to do a very brief sort of you know, reunion, get the band back on its feet with Duchess in the very late 80s, but yeah, it didn't really go anywhere. So the single's always been, again, one of those that, you know, can push the $100 mark. I don't know if it's one that's really on a ton of want lists, however. There's a couple of strikes against this single. First off, doesn't have a picture sleeve. Second, Bands, as band names go, Duchess is not exactly the most metal tag that you could come up with for your band. What are you going to be called? Cannibal Corpse, Slayer, Suffocation, Duchess. Yeah, that's probably going to make a few headbangers shy away right there. And the fact that, you know, the A-side is called Your Love and does have, you know, a little bit more of a catchy hook in those mellow verses could make people think, yeah, maybe this is a little bit too lightweight for them. I don't think that's the case whatsoever. I think it's a great single, as I've already said. The only time Duchess got any exposure after the fact was when one of the two tracks was featured on the New Wave of British Heavy Metal Volume 6. Uh, this was, again, a series of uh, bootleg compilations that came out of Japan in the, like, was it mid-90s, late-90s at this point? No, it was probably mid-90s. I think I got a lot of these in the late 90s, so I always think they came out a little bit later than they did. But yeah, Your Love was featured as track number two on volume six. If you ever look for these CDs, they have gotten a little pricey, unfortunately. Volumes four, five, and six are the three that really have a lot of the killer, obscure stuff on them. Volumes one, two, and three are fine, but a lot of the tracks there are relatively easy ones to come by four five and six is where they really started hitting a lot of the a plus material that people had not heard before and then seven eight and nine are a little bit more of a mixed bag they all three have some really really good and obscure tracks they also have some tracks that personally i don't think are that hot and they also had a few tracks here and there that are like that's a very common track i don't quite know why you picked that one to put on this 
But nevertheless, you know, this was the one time uh, that a lot of collectors got to hear Duchess. And so, you know, there was kind of a you know, spike in interest in the single there in you know, the, you know, the later 90s, early 2000s. But yeah, it's not one people talk about much anymore. It's a very unassuming single in a lot of ways, but it's a very, very good one. Uh, so don't overlook it just because the name is weird and it doesn't have a picture sleeve. All right, we've got one last one to go for tonight. This one does have a picture sleeve, and it also has a very weird name. Uh, this band is called Smokin' Roadie, which, yeah, you're either face-palming or absolutely digging it right now. No G, to be very clear. They were all out of Gs by the time the bass player got up to the counter to uh, you know, check out the rub on letters. So it's just smoke in I N at the end. Smoke and Roadie uh, came with this, you know, very kind of you know, distinctive picture sleeve just because you know it is technically color, even though it's kind of a monochrome color. It's got a I don't know what color is this? Mauve? Raspberry? I'm not sure. One suspects that maybe the local copy shop had uh, a surplus of this particular color and offered the band a one cent per copy discount if they let them use it up. I don't know. But uh, if nothing else, it does stand out a bit. This one pairs the tracks Midnight, as I mentioned there on the front, and you have a song called Rip Off on the backside. Let's go ahead and check out a clip of the A-side Midnight. And we'll talk a little bit more about Smoke and Rudy. When midnight comes around, the body and I have no friends alone again. And now it day begins, the loneliness inside I have to hide. So there is Midnight. Really nice, catchy tune. It's got a little bit of pop to it. Uh, not a pop top 40 kind of song, but again, it's meant to be catchy. It's meant to kind of get stuck in your ear very easily. But, you know, it's also a heavy enough tune. It's got a little bit of a rumble to it. Very archetypical new wave of British heavy metal sound, where again, a little rough around the edges. They're not necessarily trained musicians or anything like that, but... They know how to, gather, how to put together a pretty solid tune. Let's check out the B-side and see, can this one hold up on both sides, or uh, do we get burned on the track ripoff or not? Well, let's find out. So, yeah, that'll work. Very upbeat, energetic kind of song. Again, there's a little bit of a bounce to it so that it can get stuck in your ear. You can quickly start nodding your head, humming along to it. It's a song that play it a couple of times and you're going to remember it. And I think that's actually pretty cool. Smoking Roadie remind me a bit of another new wave of British heavy metal band called Energy that I will do a video on. One of these days, they released several songs, and they just kind of had that similar, like, you know, simple song structure, 
but a lot of, well, energy in it. Again, it has, you know, kind of a poppy, peppy beat. It's music that, yeah, is meant to you know, be a little bit of a crowd pleaser, but still sounds heavy enough, you know, that it's not going to bring in just, you know, any random wanker off the street and want to hear the song. It's still heavy enough to be a metal tune. So what do we know about Smoking Roadie? Well, they released this one single in 1983. The single, people tend to either love it or hate it. Uh, some people do not get this one at all. The new wave of British heavy metal encyclopedia I mentioned before comes down pretty hard on Smoke and Roadie. Uh, they don't seem impressed with the tunes here whatsoever. So like, okay, you know, not everyone's going to love it. That's fine. But personally, I think both tunes are quite good. Um, they did release a demo the following year in 1984. It's a relatively long demo. It's almost 30 minutes worth of songs. Um, it's got maybe six or seven songs on it. And several of those are pretty good. There are some clunkers on it. There's at least one that features a saxophone. So, ah, you know, all the recent jokes uh, about saxophones and metal that have sprung up in the past few years. Smoking Roadie was doing that back in 1984. So that's 40 years uh, ahead of their time, I guess. It sucked then, too. I'm sorry. Saxophones just are not metal. Uh, no, some things just don't work. But the demo does have some other very, very good songs on it. Uh, and again, they're in the same vein where they're trying to be, you know, poppy, catchy enough that people can instantly kind of, you know, latch onto the songs while still being heavy enough to, you know, qualify as hard rock, heavy metal, somewhere in that realm. Uh, let's see, Smoke and Roadie after the demo, though, didn't get a whole lot else done. Double checking some notes over here. Um... Yeah, they eventually, some of the members kept at it, but they changed the band's name to Tempest, and they did release one single under that name. I don't think I've heard the Tempest single. If I have, it made no impression. I literally don't remember it, so cannot comment on Tempest whatsoever. Um, I guess the only kind of minor claim to fame that Smoke and Roadie can really uh, call their own is that uh, vocalist and guitarist Rue Phillips did end up joining Bill Ward on his Bill Ward project. The band was just called Bill Ward. I guess they wanted to make sure everybody knew that Bill Ward was in it. Um, I think he contributed to the album that Bill Ward released eh, early 90s, maybe 90, 91, somewhere in there. You know, spoiler alert, the Bill Ward project didn't exactly go down a storm, not quite as popular as maybe some of Bill's earlier projects that he'd been involved with. But uh, yeah, that, that was about it for uh, Smoking Roadie's claim to fame. Now, Smoking Roadie were also featured on that new wave of British heavy metal bootleg Japanese compilation series. Uh, they were on volume five. Picture sleeves over here. And it is Midnight that was featured on this one. Again, volume five is very, very good. I'd say, again, if you just want to hear like, you know, sort of, you know, the best obscure new wave of British heavy metal all in one place, volume four is the best in the series, then volume five, then volume six. Uh, those three have a ton of good stuff that you won't come across in many places. A little thing to keep in mind, though, too. If you're looking at the covers on these, most of the volumes have, you know, different picture sleeves on the covers. The picture sleeves that are featured on the cover are not necessarily always on that particular volume. I don't remember what the exceptions are, but, you know, for example, just because there's a picture of Big Daisy on this uh, particular insert, double check the track list to make sure Big Daisy is featured on here if you really want to hear Big Daisy. Because actually, as I'm looking at this, yeah, Big Daisy is on here. But I seem to remember that there's a few instances where they put a picture sleeve on the insert. But if you checked the track list, that band wasn't actually featured, at least on that particular volume. So it, it would be a bummer if you tracked one of these down. And again, some of these uh, compilations run like 30 bucks or more a piece now. Because you like really wanted to hear Smoking Roadie, and you saw Smoking Roadie on the cover, and you bought it, and then... There's no Smoke and Roadie song on there. So always check the track list on that kind of thing. So just kind of a quick pub public service message there on an aside. 
But yeah, bottom line, you know, I think the Smoking Roadie single is better than it sometimes you know, gets credit for. It's not going to be to everybody's liking, of course. But for my money, all three of the singles that we've looked at tonight, Cynic, Duchess, and Smoking Roadie, all three of these feature two very strong songs on them. It's not just a matter of having one good song and one that's kind of forgettable or one that's a throwaway. Uh, all of these, the A-side and the B-side, are really prime examples of what bands were doing during the new wave of British heavy metal in 1981 for Duchess and 1983 for Cynic and Smoking Roadie. All right, that is going to do it for this volume. So leave a comment and let's talk metal in the comments down below. Any of these catch your ear that you were not familiar with? Are you familiar with some of these? And if so, what do you think of them? If anyone's familiar with the Tempest single, how does that one sound? If anyone's heard the Cynic full-length album, what are your thoughts on that one? Is it something I really need to go back and revisit? Or was my initial impression right? And uh, yeah, they just didn't quite get there. Let me know what you think. Hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit about some of these obscure new wave of British heavy metal bands. There are a lot of them that... Again, could Smoking Brody have made a full-length album? Eh, I don't know. That might have been pushing it. But they were able to get a few cool songs out there and have them preserved in vinyl. Kind of cool to find these types of things that are, you know, 40 years old at this point. Some of this stuff is going to get a bit forgotten, buried by time and dust. So I like to try to give these bands a little bit of a spotlight so folks can still check them out and remember how cool they were even if it was only just on a couple of songs on a single 40 years ago. All right, that's going to do it. Until next time, you know what to do. One, take care. Two, keep banging your head.